we are about to commence. May I ask Jordan to join me up here and ask you all to rise for the singing of the national anthem. You are asked to sing along with us. Eternal Father, bless our land. Guide us with thy mighty hand. Keep us free from evil powers. Be your light through countless hours. To our leaders, great defenders, grant true wisdom from above. Justice, truth be ours forever, Jamaica land we love. Jamaica, Jamaica, Jamaica land we love. Teach us to respect for all. Stern response to duty's call. Strengthen us the weak to cherish. Give us vision lest we perish. Knowledge sends us, Heavenly Father, grant true wisdom from above. Justice, truth be ours forever, Jamaica land we love. Jamaica, Jamaica, Jamaica land we love. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. I now invite Reverend Father Garth Minot, Anglican Chaplain to the University of the West Indies, to do the invocation. I begin with a brief excerpt from a book entitled Call to Teach. And this is a very brief reflection on the hymn written by Charles Wesley in 1749. Two verses of the hymn goes like this, and I won't sing it. <laughs> Forth in thy name, O Lord, we go, our daily labors to pursue. Thee, only thee, resolve to know in all we think or speak or do. The task thy wisdom hath assigned, O let me cheerfully fulfill. In all my works, thy presence find and prove thy good and perfect will. These two verses of a hymn penned by Charles Wesley are, an appropriate, are appropriate today as they were over 250 years ago. They speak of the attitude that we should have as we prepare to face our daily work. We start by assuming the correct posture, recognizing that we are stepping out in the power of God's name to pursue our task of molding minds. As we perform these tasks, we are making the resolve that God should be the foremost in all we think or speak or do. If that is our resolve, then there is no way that anything we, we do will go drastically wrong because God is in total control. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening hour asking your blessing and help as we are gathered together. We pray for guidance in the matters at hand 
and ask that you would clearly show us how to conduct our work with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm. Give us the desire to find ways to excel in our work, especially for those of us who teach. Help us to work together. Encourage each other towards excellence in work and character, and to challenge each other to reach for higher heights and to be the best we can. Father God, we ask you from the wealth of your glory to give us power through your spirit that we may be strong in our inner selves and that Christ will make his home in our hearts. We pray that we may have roots and foundations in love so that with all God's people, we may have the power to understand how broad and long and high and deep is the love of God for us. May we come to know God's love and so be completely filled with God's nature. Help us to see and know our activities, especially in our teaching and learning, are the outworking of your power among us. Help us in our use of technology, not to use them as if they are ends in themselves, but to see them as means to advance the welfare of the whole human race. Confident that the gift of teaching and learning is your way to teach us to love one another, Help us to accept our responsibility as stewards of your great bounties. Make us ever mindful of the needs of others. And help us to work towards the transformation of society and people's lives. So that the world may become a place of justice, peace, joy, and righteousness. We ask these things in the name of Jesus who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We thank Reverend Father Minot for reminding us that in everything we should seek the Lord's blessings, a truly inspiring way to begin, begin this event. Deputy Principal UWI Mona Campus, Professor Ishan Kumba Kawa, Campus Registrar UWI Mona Campus, Dr. Camille Bell Hutchinson, President of Guardian Life Limited, Mr. Eric Hossein, our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. David Yearwood and his lovely wife, Dr. Joanne Yearwood. Members of the executive and management teams of Guardian Life, heads of departments of the UWI faculty and other tertiary institutions, other distinguished guests, friends, and corporate partners of you, faculty, staff, and students, ladies and gentlemen all, good evening. Welcome to the 10th staging of the UWI GLL, Guardian Life Limited, that is, Premium Teaching Lecture Series. It is my pleasure to be your facilitator this evening. My role is to ensure that you have a background to this evening's event, especially for those who may be attending for the first time, and to ensure that the program moves smoothly and on schedule. So I'm gonna ask for your full cooperation and your undivided attention as we spend the next hour and a half together. Before I give the background to this evening's function, I wish to extend apologies on behalf of the following persons who are unavoidably absent. Professor Archibald MacDonald, Principal UWI Mona Campus. Professor E. Nigel Harris, Vice Chancellor UWI. Dr. Swithin Wilmot, 
Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Professor Peter Figueroa, Senior Professor of Epidemiology, and Dr. Winston Adams, President of the University College of the Caribbean. I guess they'll be told what they would have missed tonight. Now to the brief background, and very, very brief. This marks the 10th year of a unique partnership between the University of the West Indies and Guardian Life Limited. UWI Guardian Life Premium, premium Teaching Lecture alternates yearly with a premium teaching award aimed at enhancing the teaching process at the university while at the same time recognizing the outstanding accomplishment, uh, accomplishments of the academic staff. And that's the brief background. The evening promises to be an informative and fulfilling one, so we move straight into the program. At this time, I call on Professor Ishen Kumba Kawa, Deputy Principal of the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, to bring greetings on behalf of the Principal of the University. Professor Kawa? Let us welcome him, please. Um, uh, Master of Ceremonies, uh, thank you very much for pronouncing my name very well indeed, uh, because frequently, you know, it can be a little, you know, tongue twister. Uh, Mr. David Yearwood and your lovely wife, um, President Eric Hosson, uh, Dr. Camille Bell Hutchinson, Mrs. Sharon Fong Kong Foran, Executive Management Team, uh, Guardian Life Limited, and uh, representatives from tertiary institutions, and special recognition to the director of uh, the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. First of all, let me give apologies from Professor Archibald McDonald, who was asking me to stand in for him. Uh, he is unavoidably uh, absent, he's traveling on university um, uh, business, uh, but he's very much aware uh, of the accomplishments of this series of lectures and awards, and he would have likely to be here, uh, but uh, he sent um, his greetings that I'm delivering. As a deputy principal and former dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology, and before then the Faculty of Free and Applied Sciences, this lecture tonight, uh, gives me tremendous pleasure, pleasure and resonates with me, you know, quite well. The lecture entitled, A Learner-Centered Perspective to Teaching and Learning with Technology, the 21st Century Difference. I have, I can relate to it. I'm a chemistry teacher and I, my favorite lecture used to be uh, symmetry. Uh, those of you who have done chemistry would, have, would, uh, would, would recall uh, what a monster uh, that subject, you know, was. Uh, simply because you had to um, do a lot of imaginary stuff, you know, flipping things around and looking, looking at relationships, etc., etc. This was difficult to put across. Then came the world of visualization, where computers with computers, we are able to take an object and flip around and turn it on its head, and so, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see the difference and the similarities between a variety uh, of corners of the same shape. And that took us away from using stools to explain what a, a, a C4 rotation, you know, is when you spin the stool four times, you know, each corner goes into the other corner. Easier to say now, but uh, in those days, it was extremely difficult to put across to students Worse, if you have a car, a plane, a building, and so on and so forth. So the world of visualization has actually, or other technology, has actually helped us a great deal. And it is good to see uh, that a number of our lecturers, uh, I, I mentioned in particular Professor Lancashire in the Department of Chemistry, have actually taken this and uh, developing spectral visualization uh, techniques uh, that are used or the, the, the world over. So our teaching has been revolutionized a great deal. So that gone are the days in which our students and teachers are forced to rely heavily on pen and paper in the limited confines of a physical book 
for gathering relevant research and information uh, on a particular topic. Today's academic experience employs the use of smart boards uh, to teach tablets to read, PCs to prepare and distribute documents, and the World Wide Web to gain knowledge, gather information, explore issues and concepts at an international level. Technology has become part have become, has become an integral part of our daily lives, and with us, we are thus pleased uh, that for us as a learning tertiary, a tertiary learning institution, we emphasize and incorporate technology in carrying out our core functions of teaching, research, uh, and uh, public service. And indeed, the rebranding of the Instruction Development Unit to a center for excellence in teaching and learning, emphasizing the strategic trajectory the university is taking uh, with respect to teaching. And I'm particularly delighted to welcome Dr. David Yearwood uh, to the university and thank him for agree agreeing to present uh, today's lecture. As a regional university, while contributing to the world, it is important that we learn from the world, especially from the, the diaspora. Information sharing being extremely important uh, in today's world. Dr. Yearwood, we salute your very important work in St. Vincent and Grenadines, for which you have sourced uh, many computers uh, to support education there. The government of uh, St. Vincent and Grenadines, we understand, is making notable strides in integrating ICT in the government services, businesses, engaging and engaging science generally to improve the economy. Your work there, which is soon to be introduced into Jamaica, uh, is very important to us. And the importance of all of this is, becomes evident when you look at how, what we have done uh, as a country and as a region to um, incorporate science and technology in our development. We are, it is sad that we are now nowhere closer than where we were many years ago in engaging technology, science and technology for development. I want to teach you one concept from where I come from, just to express um, perhaps my view of where we have, uh, uh, what happened to us. And I don't want to, I want you to listen carefully because I don't want to hear that the new principle is full of expletives, especially in front of the, uh, of the, of the pastor here. But it is a, a, a term that is used very much at home to describe the phenomenon I'm going to explain to you but has nothing to do with what it might rhyme or seem uh, related to. Now, what has happened to us when it comes to science and technology is that we are stunned. Um, the Singaporeans came here to look at what we are doing, and when they went back, they did lots of things, and we are stunned. At home, Tanzania, we would say you have been hit by a bumbuazi, B-U-M-B-U-A-Z-I. When you are hit by this phenomenon, you are stunned. You can't do anything, you can't move, can't speak, can't really help yourself. You are simply stunned and you freeze. And to me, that, is, that seems to be very close to what has happened to us, in that we have not figured out how to um, uh, get some funding to begin doing things, uh, and so on and so forth. We complain and we say, well, the Singaporeans have came here to see what we are doing. They copied what we are doing and they are gone. Uh, they didn't even call us when they were going. Uh, but instead of doing that, we would like to see ourselves move a little bit closer, and therefore the, to, to action, sorry, and therefore, the, 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 the whole business of teaching science and technology, of teaching all other types of knowledge using technology to ensure that um, everybody understands what's happening and where we are going uh, is, uh, uh, is extremely important. The um, guardian life is moving away out of this thing that I described to you. Uh, the UWI is moving away, and certainly uh, Dr. Yeard is moving away. Uh, from being stunned, from being hit by this thing, uh, to actually do something about the situation. And we would like the country, we'd like the region, we'd like developing countries to emulate that example, but we shall leave that discussion uh, for another time. 
Uh, today, we have um, an important lecture uh, that is before us, and would like to, I'd like to, uh, um, to, to, to wish you all the best in enjoying uh, this lecture, and also to uh, thank uh, Professor Yeod for agreeing to make uh, uh, this presentation. I want to make a suggestion. Um, uh, when I looked at the program, as it has been running for a few years, there has been five premium lectures. There has been 12 awardees. And each one of these could write a chapter. And we have 17 chapters uh, for a book. May I suggest that Guardian Life, the UWI, um, if we can put our minds together, we could produce a book that would, uh, that would record all these ideas, excellent ideas that have been put across uh, in this series um, into, uh, into a book that could be available to many others. Please enjoy uh, this evening's lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Kawa. It gives me great pleasure to invite our next speaker to the podium. He's none other than my president, the president of Guardian Life Limited. He needs to recognize and remember that for the next hour or so, I am the boss. <laughs> so he has to fall in line and conform to my rules. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Eric Hosin. <laughs> Uh, and those are very tall rules to follow. <laughs> Protocol observed. Good evening. No, man. You know, um, in fact, this morning, Dr. Yearwood was saying to me, boy, he's so glad to be back in the Caribbean because a lot of places that he goes to is very stiff and quiet and everybody very proper. So he needs a little more oomph. So good evening. Good evening. All right, and the next thing you can do, I know some of you kind of came in late and so you were very quiet and you slipped in and you didn't even say good evening to the person beside you. So can you just turn to your friends and the person behind you and just tell them good evening and you know, welcome. You made a right choice of coming here to listen to, not Eric, but Dr. Yearwood. All right, now we've gotten the shine off the ball. Today marks a milestone in the partnership between Guardian Life Limited and the University of the West Indies in staging the annual UWI Guardian Life Premium Teaching Lecture and Premium Teaching Award Series. For the past 10 years, we have joined forces with the UWI community to promote excellence in teaching and learning, to recognize many of the stalwarts in tertiary education, and to present lectures which are geared to excite. You heard that word, excite. Now, I can assure you, just from meeting this gentleman, I can, I won't say guarantee next thing you go, but I'm sure he's gonna excite you and bring innovation to teaching and learning on this campus. The entire Garden Life family welcomes our guest, special guest, Dr. David Yearwood, the professor and chair of the technology department at the University of North Dakota. Now, I don't know where a Caribbean man find himself in them cold place there, but <laughs> Dakota is not a, <laughs> He tells me that from October, it starts snowing and the snow continues and continues and continues and continues. <laughs> and we look forward to this lecture under the theme, Learn, Learner-Centered Perspective to Teaching and Learning with Technology, the 21st Century Difference. These lectures, my friend, which, which alternate yearly with the Premium Teaching Awards are critical, a critical part of Garden Life's corporate commitment to the development of education at the tertiary level. We are pleased that the lecture and award series continue to enhance the learning and teaching processes at UWI while recognizing the outstanding accomplishment of academic staff. We cherish this fruitful partnership with the university, which is strategically aligned to our corporate vision to support what is best in Jamaica through our contribution to the development of health education, sports, and community. 
The 2013 premium teaching lecture further cements the bond we share with the University of the West Indies, and we are optimistic that this year's lecture, which focuses on technology as a central plank for both teaching and learning in the 21st century, will have a positive impact. At Garden Life, our corporate logo and identity expressly defined who we are and signals our pivotal role to improve the lives of the Caribbean people. We believe in a, the advancement in education is one of the sure ways to boost the level of success of our clients and customers in particular, and our country in general. Jamaica must have all hands on deck in a very challenging and economic and social environment, and our team is acutely aware that we must meet the discerning needs of our clients and customers as they seek to live easy. Through our special relationship with the UWI, we are placing on record our unwavering to the people of Jamaica and taking steps to improve their lives through our support of initiatives like these in education. Professor Yearwood, the Garden Life family welcomes you to Jamaica and look forward to a wonderful, wonderful lecture as we focus on how best to use technology to improve higher education. God's richest blessings to you all. Thank you. We're in good stead. <laughs> Guardian Life and the University are true business partners, and we share a relationship that has been built on mutual trust and respect. Our next presenter is someone with whom I have worked closely, and someone whom I admire, not just for her dedication to duty, but also for her frankness while still maintaining a sense of diplomacy. Please help me welcome Dr. Camille Bell Hutchinson, campus registrar, who will bring greetings on behalf of the Vice Chancellor. Dr. Bell Madam Chairperson, I must start by saying I was given no time limit. Uh, <laughs> but I don't want to spoil our friendship. That's right. Madam Chairperson, Professor Ishin Kumba Kawa, our Deputy Principal, Mr. Eric Hassin, President, Guardian Life Limited. I think Mr. Glendon Gordon, Gluten Gordon, is he here? Yes, our Vice President, Individual Life for Guardian Life. Our, our very special guest speaker, Professor David Yearwood and Mrs. Yearwood that I met, had the privilege of meeting this morning. Dr. Mervyn Chisholm, our director for the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning here at the UWI Mona. Colleagues of the UWI and other tertiary institutions that might be here, and all our specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It certainly is an honor, a very, a very great honor to bring greetings to you on behalf of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Nigel Harris. Uh, who is regrettably absent. I think we had apologies for him. This is a season for graduation, and our graduation start this weekend for the open campus and for the next three weekends. And so our principal and our vice chancellor and all the pro-vice chancellors are all attending graduation and hence his absence this afternoon. He sends his good wishes for a very successful event, and we know that he is with us in spirit. It is even a greater pleasure for me to be here on his behalf because those who know me know that my first love is in fact teaching. I am a teacher at heart, I was a teacher, I am a teacher, I will always be a teach teacher and I will always love teaching. And so it is a particular pleasure for me to be here um, to bring greetings at this occasion. As many of you may know, the UWI is the oldest university in the English-speaking Caribbean, having started as a college of the University of London in 1948 and becoming a fully degree-granting institution in 1962. We have moved from 33 students to well over 40,000 students in the last 65 years. With this kind of history and longevity in the Caribbean, it seems reasonable to expect that the UWI would see as one of its critical roles the need to lead the way in ensuring 
that the tertiary education landscape remains on the pulse of innovation and change with respect to ways of teaching that will lead to deep learning. Indeed, the UWI has already articulated its desire to have its graduates being critical thinkers, problem solvers, knowledgeable and informed individuals, and effective communicators. In order to achieve this, the Board for Undergraduate Studies pointed out in its 21st century manifesto that we must reinvent ourselves in order to confront this millennium, equipped with the methods and values of the postmodern university. As such, it acknowledged that only a student-centered, and I would wish to have that saying, the learner-centered, and a student-friendly environment can get us there and ensure that we effectively serve the region in the years ahead. It is for this reason that I am most heartened at the theme for this year's premier teaching lecture, and even more delighted that this is being presented by an outstanding son of the Caribbean soil. Student-centeredness in all its facets is the way we must go. And with technology being the driver in the 21st century, the University of the West Indies must be positioned to use technology in ways which enable our students to gain maximum benefits, learning with understanding, and thus being able to contribute positively to their own professional and personal development and to the national and regional mandates today. The university thanks Guardian Life for their continued commitment to this lecture series and congratulates the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning for its role in enabling this event. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor E. Nigel Harris, I warmly welcome Professor David Yearwood and look forward to what I know will be a most inspiring and thought-provoking lecture this evening. Thank you very much. they have held our attention. We're now gonna change the pace a bit. We're gonna rev it up with a musical interlude, compliments of the UWI Panoridim Steel Orchestra. Please remain in your seats. <laughs> Thank you. 
They were going to be so quick. I sat there waiting for yet another one. Thank you very much. Please give them another round of applause. That was truly entertaining, and I'm sure we have been re energized for round two. We are fast approaching the moment that we have all been awaiting the highlight of the evening. So at this juncture, I'm going to ask Miss Meg Peterkin a member of the UWI GLL Premium Teaching Lecture Planning Committee to introduce our guest speaker. Madam Chair, Mrs. Amicia Foster, Deputy Principal of the UWI Mona Campus, Professor Ishing Kumba Kawa, I hope I got it, Campus Registrar, UWI Mona Campus, Dr. Camille Bell Hutchinson, President of Guardian Life Limited, Mr. Eric Hosin, our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. David Yearwood, and his lovely wife, Mrs. Joanne Yearwood, members of the executive council and management team of Guardian Life, heads of departments of the UE faculty and other tertiary institutions, other distinguished guests, friends, and corporate partners of UWI faculty, staff, and students, welcome and good evening. It is my distinct honor that I have been asked to introduce to you Dr. David Yearwood. I hope to provide for you a little bit more other than what has been provided in the short bio in the program. So come journey with me into the life and service of Dr. Yearwood, an ambitious task. Dr. David Yearwood holds a PhD in teaching and learning, a Master of Science and a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Technology, and an Associate of Applied Science in Electronic Systems Technology. He is professor and chair for the Department of Technology at the University of North Dakota. He teaches at both the graduate and undergraduate levels, and as a testimony to the fine teacher that he is, Dr. Yearwood has been the recipient of the University of North Dakota's Outstanding Teacher Award on three different occasions. He has also been recognized in the who's who among America's teachers and he has been recognized by the Association of Technology, Management and Applied Engineering, a national accrediting body, as an outstanding professor in research, teaching, and service. His experience as a curriculum developer is vast. And just to highlight a few of those, he has developed two new graduate courses. They are Assessment in Higher Education and Technology in Higher Education. Dr. Yearwood has also created booklets for use in computer hardware training courses, as well as developed a computer interactive multimedia module on network computer operations. He currently reviews and revises curricular materials to enhance teaching and learning by integrating what is learned from empirical research and faculty development activities. Facilitating faculty development workshops at various, various colleges and universities, making keynote addresses at international conferences such as the Teaching Professor Annual Conference and facilitating online seminars are all part and parcel of the work Dr. Yearwood undertakes. 
One curious presentation he made to the faculty of Odegaard School of Aerospace and Sciences was entitled, Lamentations of a Technologically Challenged Faculty. I wonder if we need such a presentation here at UWI. He has authored and co-authored several refereed journal articles, completed book reviews surrounding themes of adult learning, adult literacies, online learning, and multiple intelligences. A work in progress is a book of his own entitled 10 plus two commandments for using popular technologies in a pedagogically responsible manner. And it would be quite irresponsible of me if I did not highlight his research work in teaching and learning. He has researched extensively on student-centered practices for teaching and learning and has a keen interest in the area of electronic pedagogy that is the marrying of pedagogy with technology. Another research interest is internet usage in urban and rural areas, and he has studied faculty comfort level, use, and perception of instructional technology in their classroom. Currently, one of his current research areas is involved in the in-depth development of a model exemplifying student-centered classroom practices, connection, engagement, and empowerment. Needless to say, Dr. Yearwood is passionate about teaching. He sees teaching as more than just a job. Rather, he sees it as his mission. According to a reliable technological source, a YouTube video, he, he lives for the aha moments of seeing students become transformed by the teaching learning experience. He also believes in giving back something and not just merely being on the receiving end. In light of this philosophy, he has cycled, um, this is bicycling, <laughs> not a motorbike, just in case we're trying to picture that one, and he really loves doing this. He cycled over 200 miles to help raise funds for two young boys who had brain cancer. His generosity does not stop there, as he and his wife, Joanne, are co-founders of the Jewel and Randolph Yearwood Education Technology Foundation. The goal of the foundation, which was formed in honor of his parents, is to, and I quote Dr. Yearwood from a feature on the university's website, North, University of North Dakota, the purpose of the foundation is to help increase the availability and educational opportunities for those who lack sufficient modern electronic tools with the hope that these tools can be used to provide access to 21st century technologies. To the credit of the foundation, a shipment of over 600 computers is being prepared for St. Vincent and the Grenadines from where he hails. In fact, he's exploring a similar undertaking for Jamaica. And by faith, the substance of things hoped for, we thank him in advance for that. So Dr. David Yearwood comes to us with years of experience under his technological belt. He has a passion for teaching and learning and a heart for helping others. Who better to bring this evening's UA Garden Life Premium Teaching Lecture, a learner-centered perspective to teaching and learning with technology, the 21st century difference, none other than Dr. David Yearwood. Please help me make him welcome. Mom would be happy, and Dad would be happy to hear that. And I am um, thinking, are they talking about my twin brother here? Uh, <laughs> Madam Chairman, Chairwoman, um, all of the distinguished guests, Mr. Hosen, for your support of activities like this for faculty, because it's really important that we have those kinds of connections and relationships, because it, it, it's, we have to work with students to get them to the point where they can go out and work with companies such as yours. And we need to make certain that they understand exactly what that job entails. We need to understand that so we can better prepare them for it. Now, I have to tell you that um, the bar is really up there for me in terms of what I have to do this evening, and I'm gonna try to live up to it. Uh, a couple of ground rules. Number one, I don't, I hate standing behind this thing. So I'm not gonna be behind there too often I'll try to remember to use the mic because uh, you need to get that. Um, I also move around 
and I do have interactive sort of lectures. So, here is how this would work a little bit. Uh, at some point, I'm going to seek interaction, your interaction. And generally, when a presenter or faculty asks or puts a question out there on the floor, pretty much what happens is that um, the person suddenly becomes engaged in something else. <laughs> and they don't make eye contact. <laughs> and so I know how to get down there. <laughs> And, and I really truly want this to be a fun activity. Um, I think to some extent sometimes we've taken some of the fun out of education. So I'm going to work to try to put some of that fun back in. And hopefully uh, we would have an enjoyable, informative, educational kind of opportunity and time to have questions answered relative to some of the work that I do. I need to clear up one thing first off. How much time, what is my time at this meeting? And so I should be stopping somewhere here about... I'm just looking at my watch here. Okay. Uh, I don't know that I, I don't know everybody's names, and I apologize for some of the very distinguished guests in front here. Uh, Deputy Principal, uh, the Registrar, Dr. Chesham for working with you and for the opportunity to work with this group as well. And then other distinguished guests, faculty, uh, staff, students. Uh, let me just get a couple of things set up here, so if you give me one minute just to get some of this straightened out. I should point out that I normally put up, um, it's kind of interesting here, in that I normally have to supply the music. So when I do presentations, I normally have some little musical interlude, and it's fairly quiet and nice, easy going, and then right before I speak, I kind of ramp that up. And so the band, the steel band group here did an awesome job, but I don't know why it should be okay for them to be the one to be dancing and we were sitting still. That's <laughs> not fair. Welcome aboard. It's 2007 and we are more committed to your safety than ever. And that's why we'd like you to pay careful attention to this important safety information. First, please make sure that your seatbelt is securely fastened. <laughs> Seatbelts can be purchased for $5. <laughs> to fasten, insert the metal fitting into the buckle and tighten the buckle by pulling the loose end away from you. To release, Purchase a release flap for $7. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. We've never paid for seatbelts before. Once we've reached our cruising altitude, your flight attendant may or may not go down the aisle with snacks. If she chooses to, each passenger will be given a single peanut. <laughs> Lavatories are located at the front and the rear of the airport. Please take a moment to look at your safety pamphlet. The charge for looking at this pamphlet is $3. The charge for looking at this pamphlet and putting it back quickly is $4. Should there be a rapid change in cabin pressure, oxygen masks will automatically drop from the compartment above your seat, free of charge. Place the mask over your nose and mouth. And to start the flow of oxygen, pay your flight attendant $75.63. <laughs> As always, exact change is appreciated. Now I know that some of you are still concerned about getting there safely. Enjoy your flight. This is what it was like for me coming to Jamaica. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I probably have too many things here. Normally I have a lapel mic, so I don't know. I'm going to try to see if I could make this work. Because I move around a little bit too much. Just briefly a little bit of what I do and what I like. Uh, yes, I do live in North Dakota. And yes, it's tough up there in terms of the weather. I'm an outdoors person. I refuse to stay inside. So these are some of the activities. And um, all of those crazy bikes, yes, I do ride them. <laughs> My wife was not too happy taking a photo with 20-something uh, degrees below zero. Um, and so I have to acknowledge my wife, Sister Ruthin, said something this morning that was rather interesting. She said, um, you don't normally have spouses coming, you know, but behind every so-called successful person uh, is a spouse. 
cause, our significant other. And so, <laughs> this is our work and agenda. And essentially, the question I want to pose to you is, uh, I want you to consider what changes are necessary in the 21st century, in 21st century education. Because I think changes really have to occur for good reason. And we'll get into some of these in just a little bit, but three main things that I'm going to focus on and talk about, and then I'm gonna come full circle back to looking at that question that I posed to you relative to the changes that we may have to make in education. I put this up here because I want you to look at and think about this teacher-centered, uh, learner-centered paradigm. And I'm gonna just step out of the way for you to see that. I'll share the work of some of the people who suggest ways in which we should be teaching. And this is something that I do frequently, uh, it's not gonna work, and um, what I'm trying to do is hit two buttons simultaneously to blanken the screen. Uh, Richard Meyer talks about this whole notion of visual and textual and audiovisual content. And so frequently, when presenters put something up there, guess what the audience does? Start reading. And pretty much, it does not matter what the presenter says. You don't hear it. Or you alternatively have what is called as cognitive overload. And in essence, you have something taking place up there and something taking place down here, and you have divided attention. And we're gonna talk about some aspects of why that's not a good thing to do and how we manage the technology to avoid those kinds of issues. Uh, let's look forward, move forward here a bit and look at some of the instructional methodologies, which I'm certain a number of you are familiar with. Uh, because indeed we have used a lot of these at one time or another. The problem is that I think sometimes we have a focus on one or more of these pedagogical techniques. And then even worse, sometimes we use that one all the time. So for instance, you have situations where students will say, for instance, students will say things like, um, I didn't know that every class was a PowerPoint class. Or I didn't know that every class was going to be a lecture where the faculty basically did all of the talking and the students did very little interaction. And so we're gonna talk about how to change some aspects of that and I'll show you some actual examples that I use in some of the research that I've studied where I look at how these influence teaching and learning. I want you to take a look at this and I apologize for some of the, the color schemes What you're looking at is probably something you're very familiar with already, retention rates. So the first question goes to you, ma'am. Oh, and you do have an option here. You can say pass, and you have to pick someone to pass to, but you can't pass the second time. So the question here is, if this is indeed what the retention rate represents, then how should faculty be teaching? Oh, and I didn't tell you, um, I do have a gift if you answer the question correctly. <laughs> oh, you can pick or you can answer, or you can pass rather. Yeah, what is this really saying, generally, anybody? What is this saying about? Right, they remember 5% of lectures. And therefore, if that is the case, then how should we approach teaching and learning? Less lecturing, more what? More practice by doing. So we need to change the classroom dynamics such that it takes into account the ways in which students remember things. Do we give her a pen, by the way? I think this gentleman was asking and answering a lot of it over here. Oh, he is, so that's why. classroom environment uh, looks almost like this. And I want
students that think you get it. And if you've gone to school, and most of you, all of you pretty much have, you've graduated, you see some of this. And the sad part of this is that that's what's happening yet today in some of our classrooms. And I really don't call that teaching and learning. I call it more preaching than anything else, right? And it's not that preaching is bad, but what bothers me a little bit is that I don't think we're using the tools that are available to us to challenge students, to take a more active role in their education, to actually work to enhance our work with students. And so what ends up happening sometimes is we have this thing called PowerPoint, and PowerPoint has become nothing more than the glorified projector. You know, we use it in a very similar way to reinforce some of the same old routines that existed for so long ago. And we really need to change that. So sometimes when we point the finger at students and we say, they're not doing the work. There's three of these things that are pointing back at us. And the question has to become, what are we doing to help them understand that content and make connections between the various parts of whatever it is that they're pursuing, they're studying. We have to work. This thing called teaching and learning is a collaborative sort of an activity. Education is not a spectator sport. And to some extent, that's almost what we have made it. A passive sort of an environment where we do all of the talking and pretty much all of the learning and students are not getting as much opportunities to learn as they should. There are a lot of phrase I'm phrases I'm gonna throw out at you. And I want you to think about them, not because they're cliche sort of phrases. He or she who talks the most learns the most. Seems obvious, seems not so obvious. Bear with me here a little bit. If you have to teach someone something, right? How much time is involved in preparing to teach that? A lot. And you go through a lot of gyrations in terms of, should I do this, shouldn't I do that? And would I, should I include this, should I not include this? How would I present this so that it's understood, right? What you don't realize is that as you go through those kinds of activities, mental and physical, you're actually learning an awful lot. But the people at the other end who are receiving what it is you're sharing with them, how much learning is taking place? If all they're doing is basically just sitting and listening. And so we have to change that environment. And yes, you would say, well, some of that same thing is what you're doing, to an extent. It's not that the lecture is bad. I think what has to happen is we need to chunk the lectures, make them a little shorter. John Medina says, and this is fairly recent study, he's a molecular biologist. You have 30 seconds to gain an audience attention. And you have nine minutes and 30 seconds to hold it. Now, what does that portend for us in education? Perhaps our lectures should be shortened, where we focus on one single topic and then get a mental break. There's some things that I did here that I'm not certain if you're aware consciously of what I'm doing, but I'm purposefully doing them. Let me just blank the screen here for a little bit. Okay. I played a small piece at the beginning. What was that piece? cause you to hint, hint, you had to pay for things that you didn't think you should be paying for. He can, okay, so you see he's passing to him, and sir? Is there a board table? Is there an attendant? Right. There is something that I did that I'm not certain if you were conscious that I was doing that. How many of you thought that that was funny? You could raise your hand. This is interactive, remember, you know, I just want to sit there because I'm going to call on you. Okay. How many of you it kind of got your attention. Everybody, this is something faculty you need to do. When you walk into the classroom, the assumption is made that students, you can flip the switch and you can start lecturing or you can start right into the topic and they're there with you. They are not. If students are like you or like me, they have things on their minds that they brought into the classroom environment with them. Uh, I wonder what I'm making for supper tonight. I don't have money, enough money to put a full tank of gas. Uh, I have a sick child, I have a parent, I have a problem with my spouse, 
All of these things are legitimate things to those students. We cannot simply pretend that they do not exist. And so what do we do? What I did was purposefully distracted you to something that was slightly humorous. I call that as connecting. I am trying to connect with you. Those first few minutes of class are very important. All of my classes pretty much starts this way. There is a musical interlude or there's a YouTube piece being played and I don't do that all the time. The very first class or the second class, I would do that. And then I pass around a sheet of paper and I ask students to put their names on, on a date that they will bring in a piece that they can share something with us. Sometimes they will bring in things that are related to the topic. The only rule is that it has to be something that's uh, clean. Okay. <laughs> And you have, you, you have to be sensitive to people as well. You know, other students, your peers in class. And that moment of focused attention is great to get us to forget some of the things that we came into the room, to in essence hit the reset switch so that we are now ready to listen, to be involved, to participate. But faculty, you have to find a way to segue from that connecting element into whatever that content is. And sometimes my students do it for me. I am allowing students to be involved in their education. I'm inviting them to be a co-educator with me. The learning environment that you create should not be one just for your students. It's also one for me as well. That's why I expect my students to particip participate in conversations and discussions. I expect quite a bit of them. And they start off not liking that. But I have to work with them to get them to that point where they realize that it's not all about me as the faculty. There's several other things that I do in my classroom. A one-footer means you really should be paying attention. A two-footer, you better remember that. It's going to be on a test. <laughs> Boy, when I do a two-footer, watch the class kind of this start writing, which is fine. I think the best compliment that I've ever had as a professor was when a student got up there and pretended to be me. I started saying, do I do all those kind of things? <laughs> One foot <of> jumping up, <laughs> moving around. But apparently, yes. What I'm trying to do is move away from this teacher-centric model to one that's more participative, learner-centered. There are ways to address the content without taking the fun out of what we're doing. But it requires some work on our part. I had this slide up here with regard to a popular PowerPoint, a popular um, software. On my campus, for some reason, people think I hate PowerPoint. It's not that I hate it. What I hate is the inappropriate use of this really too easy to use tool. Ed Tuff, who's the guru of presentation graphics said, PowerPoint is evil. Well, I don't know that PowerPoint per se is evil. And I know what Ed is saying. He's a Yale professor, distinguished professor. If he ever puts on a seminar, you want to go to it because nobody, according to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, can make graph, uh, visual content come alive like Ed Tuff can. When your students write, I don't blame the pen. Some of you are so, what is this? Was that a joke? Yes, it was. <laughs> here is the problem with regard to PowerPoint up here. Text, too small, or too much text, right? Second thing, bullets. These things come in on the side, and one of these days, somebody's gonna get hit with one of them, <laughs> and it's not gonna be fun. Then we have fonts. Oops, my pointer, ah, went out there. Need to go forward. So then we have this font. Uh, faculty, if you're trying to project text, do not use the fonts that have this little curly thing there. Because what? They're hard to read when projected. They are called, is it serif or sans serif? Are you sure? Now I've got you really thinking about this. Who is going to be brave and say what it is? It's serif. So which one I want up there then, the curly ones? Sans serif, the one without the curl. Okay. Then we also have 
this thing here, which represents what, ma'am? See, she doesn't want to look at me now. Okay. <laughs> this thing up here that I'm pointing to, that represents, say, a colorful slide. Yeah, she said yes. Okay. <laughs> um, in essence, what happens is some people are colorblind. And we may project things up there, and they can't see it. And so you have to be careful in terms of the color of the font that you choose because it went right past students. Then, of course, we have all of that stuff up there. Which what? Too much. Okay. So be careful with your use of PowerPoint. Be also careful with the use of templates. I can't tell you how many uh, times, which is why I'm so thankful I have a very patient wife, who basically drove back and no a truck was in the way. No, let's do it again. And so I created this little template. Why? Why do you think I created this? Sado. What does this communicate to you, by the way? What's that? Podcast is one way, so we have a street called podcast. We don't, in fact. I created that. But this got your attention. Somewhat. It resonated with you. Maybe. Maybe not. So faculty, when you're developing PowerPoint pieces, try to think of how and what kind of message you communicate, try attempting to communicate. There's three things with regard to PowerPoint. So I will come back to connection because I talked a little bit about that. But since we're on PowerPoint, let's stay with this for a little bit. Three things to be careful with with regard to PowerPoint. They're listed right there. And they are, ma'am? Now, should we ask her to explain each one of those to us so that we get a sample? Of course. Here's the thing. I could go through, and because this is planned for me, I go through and I talk about this. But in the classes that you work with students, where are you providing opportunities for students to interact with the content that's up there? How are you planning this in your lecture or chunk lectures? How are you involving students in this activity called teaching and learning? Because it is. A little bit about overload. What's wrong with this slide? Too much information for students to try to do this. And you're trying to talk over this, and they're not listening to you. So that was textual overload. This would be the equivalent of visual overload. Very good. Too much activity happening there. Here's an interesting dynamic. What do you get from the slide, from the images? What are you taking away from that? Not a whole lot. Could that be representative of cognitive dissonance? Maybe. And then when I throw this in, you're trying to see how is that even related, the one at the bottom. You can't make the connection. Faculty, we do this all the time without realizing it. We have one or the other. In this case, what I was attempting to kind of get here is we load up the technology with all of the instructional content. We use the mechanism of Blackboard, which is a learning management system, and then we deliver it to students. And if when you do that, you call that learning, I don't think so. I think it's something else. This is why we have to rethink what we're doing with students, because that is not learning. Can't see anything. I grabbed that slide from Ed Tuff's work, and basically, Basically, what Ed Tuff was saying is that we can have things, PowerPoint can do the job of reducing something that's very important, thus making it something rather insignificant. You can't read that slide very well, but this was a slide that was used by NASA for one of the briefings with the shuttle, the Challenger shuttle aircraft. And you may have heard about that. A piece of foam fell off, but you wouldn't get that from this. A piece of foam fell off from one of the tanks, hit the shield, or the, one of the shields on the shuttle, damage it. 
If you go all the way down here, you start off looking, you see the word significant, and then this is indented, can cause significant tile damage. There was the problem. They have, in essence, taken something that's very important and made it something very insignificant by virtue of the different levels of bullets there. That's problematic. So when we create PowerPoint slides, how does the level of what we set up, what does that communicate to students and how are students perceiving that? There's a problem here. And we have to look long and hard at our practice because we are not doing it justice. If this is what we do, and we call it teaching. It's a bitter pill to swallow, but I think we need faculty to re-examine our work in the 21st century in light of what did not work prior. I need to go back here a bit in slides, so bear with me. Um, I should have put a return here, but I need to get back to something because I want to show you how I create some aspects of um, interaction in my classes. And you have to consciously build these in. point you've probably heard about this. This is what? Jeopardy. I call it reverse jeopardy. I ask the questions and then students provide the responses for me. In essence, this is how I cover an entire class. And then the way this is set up, and if you need any of this, anything that I talk about or anything that I show, feel free to send me an email because all of this stuff is available for anybody to use in their classroom. Prepackage. You change the content, insert your content, and life is good. So let's play Je Jeopardy as a way of showing you how this actually works. Who wants to pick a category and number? You just did? What number? Education 500. He doesn't know what he's getting into here. really challenge. Now you see what he should have done if he was my student, he'll pick a 100 level. <laughs> because the 100s are easy. By the time you get to 500, this is increasingly difficult, right? But here's how this works, and the template and everything is available for you if you need it, faculty. I have two students who are the judges. They have the answers to everything. They have a key. I have another student who is a timer. The students are divided up into groups. And so they compete against each other for points. Now, they come into this thinking this is a high stake thing, and it isn't really, but I'm keeping that in reserve. But we cover the content without me as a faculty saying and preaching very much. Who's covering the content? A student group is. And when they provide a response to this, the judges have to decide, you're right, you're not right, you're partially on, and then they could award no points or partial credit. And then another group gets to debate them and say, wait a minute, that's not what was said in the textbook, that's not how I interpreted it. What's happening there? Interaction, peer teaching. There's a lot of things taking place there. And faculty, that's what we should be working towards. Now I have to tell you for this to work, Students have to do their homework. And students don't like homework. So I point out to them how, as a faculty, I am doing a heck of a lot of homework. So why should I be the only one doing homework here? Right? Doesn't work that way. Students need to be involved in their own education. Okay, let's pick another one. You have to be careful here with this PowerPoint because you can't hit escape. You have to go down to this navigation return button down there. I'm going to pick one for you, just take 500 technology. They love it when they come across this, because that means double, triple points, depends on which one, right? 
I'm going to skip this and go to an easier question so you kind of get the feel for what I'm doing. Who? Factual. What? Factual. I want students in the 21st century using 21st century tools to know something that is completely different from understanding something. And it's completely different from applying what they've learned. Those three things need to occur in a modern classroom. Students need to demonstrate knowledge, show understanding, and be able to do something with what it is you've exposed them to in the classroom. What is driving learner-centered instruction? Assessment. We are being held accountable for what our students are learning in the classroom. In other words, somebody is monitoring what's happening, and somebody wants data to say, definitively, students are, in fact, learning what we want them to learn. Here is something that I do rather frequently in my class. I come up for air. Stop. Freeze the content. How are you doing? in terms of what we've talked about. What's the muddiest point? What is something that you're still struggling with? I move it over to another set of students. How are you guys doing in here? And I look for nods or heads, or I look for these blank stares, because I'm reading my students. I want to feel for what they understand from what we just talked about. If they don't get it, what does it mean? That I need to do what? Reteach it the same way I taught it before? No. Teaching and learning is not an easy task. And nobody says that I am the only expert in the room, and nobody says the students come to us as blank slates. They don't. Students bring their technology to the classroom. You can say, don't turn it on. Don't do anything with it. But they have ways to figure that out under the table. If I see a one finger swirling, I know something is happening there and it certainly ain't typing in what I'm saying, right? So what do you do? You can fight it or you can attempt to fight it, but you're not gonna win. Note passing, distraction did not start with technology. People have been doing that for a long time. They've been passing little notes, little wink of the eye. And you think they're listening to you and they're smiling to another person so what do you do as a faculty? If I see one or two, perhaps three people, by the time the third person is there, I need to change topic, or I just suddenly say, tech break, get it out of your system, hit the send button, do it 30 seconds. <laughs> no kidding. I give them 30 seconds to scratch that technological itch, whatever it is. And so they do that, and after they're done with that, then I say, put it away. And guess what they do? They put it in their laps. And I said, no, no, no. Put it away, out of sight. And they kind of look at me hesitantly. What they do? Because they know that somewhere down the road, I'm going to give another 30-second break, tech break. Alternatively, I would say to them, I could teach this content, I'm saying to myself, but rather than teach it, I say to them, go to a website or go to a search, look up this particular content area. Let's have a conversation about it after you've discussed it or when you think you understand some aspect of it. What I'm doing is I'm finding ways to utilize in a productive way the tools that, if not properly managed, become a distracting element. Create opportunities for students to use their technologies right in your class. Somebody from time to time, from week to week, is my technology expert or my content checker. And don't go to Wikipedia or Wiki. I, it's not that it's bad, but I found too much inaccurate information there. So I said to them, you have to double check that content. Let me jump forward here quickly. So we've seen, what's it? Cognitive overload. What's the second one? Dissonance, reductionism. And reductionism was the one with um, Ed Tuff. 
where the Challenger, uh, the Challenger shuttle, which was this one here. Okay. Now I want to show you perhaps another way of taking those earlier slides and reworking them. This might work for you. It's a mix of text and visual video content or visual content. Explaining the operation of a PLC cycle. But rather than me explaining it, because I want to make it learner-centered, I would turn to students and say, explain this to me. What do you think is happening there? Again, I should not be the only one to speak in here. Right? Students have a voice. Let them use it. This might be another way to describe what's happening. And this is a third way to do this. Faculty, I have to tell you, there are a lot of stuff that's created already out there, and you shouldn't be reinventing the wheel. Look for what other faculty have created, because we all share our information. And you should be able to use that information to enhance your work with students in the classroom. Here's a model that I'm playing around with, and I'm working with two other colleagues, and I'm leading this study, in which we look at this whole notion of C. I mentioned to you connection, right, and how that works. I want you to tell me where you have seen me practice some form of engagement. Questions, okay, what else? Eye contact, really important. Those kind of things that we sometimes take for granted. What else? in terms of engagement. Movement. My students don't get on the web very often because they know I'm coming up this way. <laughs> Sometimes I teach from the back of the room. And so when I'm back here, guess what you just did? You turned around. John Medina says, physical activity is cognitive candy. If you ever doubt that, when you're in a class or you're in a meeting, uh, sorry, Mr. Hossein, I hope this doesn't happen at all to you where people are in meetings. <laughs> And it's that drifting off. Stand up. That wakes you up. And so the same thing happens here in terms of physical activity in the classroom. Whoever said that you have to sit there all the time for the whole hour? I once had my 8 o'clock class when I sensed that they're struggling to stay awake. We taught the class with content located different parts of the room, and they had to move about, and they never sat. It was purposeful. You couldn't sit. I am desperate, and I will stop at nothing to get people's interaction going, <laughs> whatever it takes. And so we need to employ some of those as well. Empowerment is something we need to talk about. I'm going to have a few slides before I get to this. Here are some creative approaches, and they're not all that creative, that you can use in a classroom. <laughs> Education should not be me telling you stuff. It should involve aspects of, what if we do this? How come? And then ultimately, okay, so I do this, or I'm going to do this, then what? That's pretty much how I plan a lot of my classes. <laughs> questions are great, but there's some questions that just shouldn't be asked. I mean, you're flying a kite. The guy comes up to you and says, you all flying kite? <laughs> and the guy says, what? No, I'm just fishing for birds. <laughs> so, I am pushing and suggesting that you use questions in the classroom. Well, what is the nature of the questions or what should they look like? is that question? What's that? Oh, the, the type, is, type is too small? Who said this type is too small? Who's saying that the type is too small? Get over it, lady. Jeez. <laughs> you want glasses or something? 
It is too small. But the question, can we get more people to choose the stairs by making it fun for them to do? Can we get more students excited about education by changing the educational environment? The answer is yes. How do we do it? I'm running around. I'm getting a lot of exercise. What kind of exercise are you getting? Stand up for a moment. Just stand up, everybody. Just stand up for one moment. Okay, now you're standing. Kind of put your hands up here. Wave. Nice big wave. Next one. Okay, sit down. You're all compliant. That's okay. to do that. And tomorrow we're going to show, I'm going to show you some of those for the faculty who are going to be in attendance. But faculty change we must. We know how energizing it can be in the classroom. If you like me, you really do live for that aha moment. Are you seeing it? And if you're not seeing it, what are you doing about it? Because you really need to do something about it. We talk about purposeful questions. Long, I know. Read it, you must. <laughs> now you read that and you're saying, are you serious? I teach a class technology in, health, uh, technology in society and one of the modules is dealing with health. Technology in health. And so I throw this up. Purposefully to provoke an emotional response. Students are emotional creatures at every level. And this is more intended to stimulate discussion than anything else. But I do occasionally have students say, uh, Dr. Yeo, you can't be serious. And I said, yes, you have a problem with that? What I'm trying to do is get a conversation going. For us to, see, to look seriously at an issue that we have to wrestle with at some point in our lives. If you've ever had someone who was sick and you had an encounter with the medical system, you know what that's like. So the questions that I pose to them are simply these. Because I want a conversation. I can easily cover this content by lecturing. I choose to not lecture at students. I choose instead to engage students. That's the difference between learner-centered instruction and teacher-centric instruction.
creative way to do something he always enjoyed. Faculty, we can find ways to make education fun. We can become creative. Sometimes some of the best ideas for content that I have to address in class comes from students. They're not all my own. And students become active participants in this thing called teaching and learning. And they share this content with me in the hopes that I will share it with future classes or we can probably talk about it right now. I project this up there and you're looking at it and you're saying, how gross. This is also part of what I was covering uh, in the health te in technology and health uh, unit. But by putting just the graphic up there, I was purposely trying to stimulate conversation. Put into context, you start to realize, oh, this is where he's going with this. You don't believe it, ma'am, but this is what you would have to look like, according to scientists, if you want to live to be 150 years old. <laughs> the body needs to be re-engineered. See those ears? Do this for a moment. Notice how your hearing just become very acute? So those pointy tip ears are there for a purpose. You're not buying any of this, are you? <laughs> but here is the actual article. If I had just put this up on PowerPoint, guess what students would be doing? Writing it down because they figured it's gotta be important I put it up there. There's something else subtle at work here. There is going to be no opportunity for conversation because I have done everything up there for them. So I purposefully sometimes do not label my diagrams. I let students lead me in labeling it or lead the class in labeling it. Did they throw on that slide? You think that's enough water to run straight on down there, just so perfectly? And then this, how many times would this guy have to try this to get that right? And how come he's trying this one time now? You know, where he got it right? He would have had so many broken bones. There's no way. So I'm the skeptic. I question this. Have your students question stuff? Don't let them just take it at face value and accept it. They should not. Because I said it as the professor, you accept it, why? I really wanna find out why. Our students need to be active participants. I just got the signal there, hurry up. The time is running out. <laughs> we do the calculations, uh, we'll find out that this doesn't look right. Somebody fudged this and that's my personal belief. <laughs> your handout contains some things about this aspect of engagement. And I challenge you to look at it. Because students need to repeat something to remember it. Emphasis. What's that? Repetition is the master. John Medina says, and he did pep sc uh, brain scans to see this. He said that if content is not revisited within 60 to 90 minutes of when that content was shared, excuse me, the neurons in fact look like they were never exposed to the content, they reset. So we need to communicate very strongly to students. Repeat to remember. That's one of John Medina's rules. What's the next one? Remember to repeat. <laughs> yeah, some kind of common sense. But this works equally for faculty and students alike. You look at this and you say, you gotta be kidding. I taught a whole lecture, a whole session, a 75 minute session, just from this. Students are competitive. Who completed those uh, squares that needed to be filled in? Students did. Who came up with the answers? Who debated? They did.
Okay, so you've read that. What do you think the creative person is going to do? Anybody? Okay, if the risk increase, modest risk. People can become very creative, man. Now, what do you think just she is going to do for a high risk situation? What's that? You looked at it already. <laughs> Here are four challenges and four opportunities. I never let anybody say I can't. I don't entertain people saying I can't do this. I don't know. Don't know and can't are not acceptable in my classroom. Period. I want students to at least attempt an answer. We can personalize technology, uh, um, education. And we can do this with 21st century tools where we have to understand how we change the classroom dynamic from one where I am introducing content to one where I'm having a discussion of content. I no longer have in use my class time to introduce anything. I pose questions and I put content out there for students to examine and I require that they look at that before they come to class. When we come to class, now we're talking about the content that they're already familiar with. Parker Palmer said something that was very kind of it resonated with me. A graduate faculty came into the classroom and she sat down and she said to students, do you have any questions? And for 50 minutes, he said, you know, the 50 minute period, she basically sat there quietly and she just looked at them. And then she got up and she left and says, great, lecture's done. The next day she come back to class and he said she got about 30 minutes into it, nobody said anything and she got up and she said, great, class is done. The third time she came back, students caught on. You read the content, and you come to class to discuss it. And they had excellent conversations thereafter. I'm not suggesting you go try that. You know? <laughs> it might not work <laughs> unless you set it up properly. things have to change and faculty they have to change because we need to change them why should education change I just want to share one little thing with you you're informed that you have some medical issues that are going to result in some complications for the child that your wife is bearing do you ignore it no you take action you go for a medical checkup and you discover you've got stage three cancer and you have to make a decision. You ignore it? No. That happened to me just last semester where I had to have radi radical surgery to take care of it and it didn't get, uh, get all of the cancer, but that's fine. We have signs that what we're doing in the classroom to some extent is not working. Faculty, what are you doing about it? You cannot ignore it because the students are not going to come to you any longer. They're going to go someplace else where they can get the kind of education that they're seeking. The classroom dynamics have to change and you and I are the change agents that need to make that happen. We have technological tools to help us use them appropriately because they can make a difference in the classroom. I've tried to show you some things and I've tried to model some things here. The work starts today. Don't try to change your entire practice tomorrow. Start changing small portions of it, a little bit at a time. Start getting your classes more student-centered, learner-centered, rather than faculty-centered. I end a lot of my classes this way. So what? So why? Now what? I would say to students, and I'll say to you, you invested some time this evening to come to listen to me talk about some aspect of learner-centered instruction. What are you taking away with you? You're never going to get that time back. 
I hope that something productive comes of the time that we've had together. What are you going to do? My students are often expected to share some brief something about what they learned before they leave the class. And I'm patient because I'll sit there and wait for people to share. I want to make certain that they're taking something away with them. So what are you taking away with you? You don't have to share it right now, but at least I hope you think about it. Do I have time to entertain some questions or how do you normally pretty much finish? Okay. Uh, thanks for coming. I hope, um, oh, you can take some questions. Okay. Two questions, the moderator said. Two. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, you did mention that a change in the environment is very important. Now, we have all these technological advancements, internet, and so on and so forth. And going through the entry requirement of a tertiary institution, you find that entry requirement is still the same as it was 100 years ago. Six CFC service, there's no requirement for uh, one year internet um, service, <laughs> tablet, laptop, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I think we're fighting um, the technology and that is a problem. Yeah, it is a problem. And I, I want to come at this from uh, directly and indirectly. There's certain content knowledge that students have to get, right, relative to the topic or the discipline. Park that content over there someplace in a learning management system. PBWorks is free. Uh, scholarly is, Schoology is free. If you not, don't have a learning management system, you can use those to park some of that content out there and require the student to do that out of class activity. With regard to the technology itself, I think at some point, we as faculty have to start saying, okay, we're gonna change this, and then start becoming creative about how we change it. When I teach my classes, and I have electronic classes, and I have a whole lot of, I have, uh, what is technology, um, from the inside, technology and society, which is more a philosophical approach to looking at technology. When I grade students' work, the essays that they turn into me, I mark it up. And I've had students frequently say, I didn't know this was a compre English comprehension class. And I would say to them, darn, I forgot to tell you. Every class I teach is an English comprehension class. So likewise, when it comes to the technology, I think we start small. We have a foundation uh, that we work with, on with other faculty, and we're willing to find some technologies for you faculty. And I, I'm, I'm certain that there are ways for us to get some of these beginning technologies to start to work with. So I think, yes, um, Dr. Chisholm worked with the group to try to provide uh, pedagogical training with regard to the technology use, utilization. I think we need to become creative in where do we find grants to get some of these technologies, put it in the hands of faculty so that they can take it home where they do most of their work, not necessarily require them or tie them to their office to do it, right? But I think we have to become creative. I hear you with regard to the lack of, you know, if standards don't exist, technological standards or technological literacy, literacy standards, then start writing them, I would say. You know, and if you want help with some aspect of that, I can share with you what exists at our institution. I think there has to be a little bit more collaboration, and I'm certainly willing to do a lot of that for my campus. Uh, Mario Rose, uh, from Gal, in the UK. Um, my question is, um, is simply, no, no what? Because we have, you know, digested um, most of the techniques um, or we're going to expose it tonight. I mean, uh, they have been around. We have just not looked at them that way. Um, so, and it will help you in personal development as well. I mean, after applying some of these techniques, you go, you will go outside and you look at things differently. Or, um, how can we constantly apply some of these techniques? Um, um, is there a website? Is there YouTube? Or like you know, materials from you. How can we, you know, time to time just take tidbits and apply them to our personal life? I actually um, just came back from the teaching professor where I was doing a technology conference on the use of iPads. 
And the, the title was, Bet You Didn't Know You Could Do This With Your iPad. And there are lots of little things. And tomorrow, I'm going to show some of the use of some of those tools. And that's the kind of work that Dr. Chisholm is doing, where he provides opportunities for faculty and other people to learn about the technologies so that they can start applying them. Everything that I shared with you, anything that you see there or you want to continue the conversation, I'm more than happy to because my work does not end with my conversation with you tonight. My work just starts. So I am more than willing to entertain questions, uh, whether it's looking for support or looking for pointers of where to go to pick up some of this. I can work with you, email me, not a problem. So I'm willing to help in those areas. Thank you very much. I think we can do better than that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Energizing, engaging, thought-provoking. Thank you very much, Dr. Yerwin. Uh, may I ask you to join me up here, please? We have a small presentation to make to you. Okay. And I'll ask Dahlia Mosley to make that presentation to you. Is it on the happening screen? Yeah. Which one is it? Yeah. Dr. Yeah. 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 I guess I lied a little. It was an hour and a half, I said. We're here a little longer, but I'm sure you won't penalize any of us for this tonight. It was worth the, 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 the time. We couldn't shorten uh, Dr. Yearwood's presentation. He had to get to the meat of the matter and leave us with food for thought. So, his, to me, and I'm sure to all of us, his presentation was excellent. We, it's things that we know, a lot of things that we know, but we don't put into practice. And we recognize that if, if teaching is to truly take place and learning is to take place, we have to adjust the way we do things. Allow me to share with you what the Greek philosopher Aristotle had to say about excellence. Excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We do not rightly act because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have those because we have acted rightly. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. The time is now 8 o'clock, and we're about to bring the curtains down on an exciting evening. I now call on my colleague and friend, Glendon Gordon, Vice President, Individual Sales, Guardian Life, to move the vote of thanks. And here you will see the long and short of it. <laughs> you stand right here so you see the long and short of it. <laughs> Thank you, Alice Hill. Madam Chair, this is Alice Hill Foster, Deputy Principal, Professor Ishen Kumbo Kawa, <laughs> Campus Registrar, Dr. Camille Bell Hutchinson, President of Guardian Life, Eric Hossin, our distinguished guest speaker, David Yearwood, Dr. David Yearwood, and his lovely wife, Dr. Joanne Yearwood, members of the Executive Council and Management Team of Guardian Life, heads of departments of the UWI faculty and tertiary institutions, other guests, friends, and corporate partners of UWI, faculty, staff, and students. Good evening. <laughs> Sound like you're getting tired now, eh? All right, the evening is well spent. You will agree with me that this evening was an evening well spent and uh, for this, I would like to thank some special persons. Reverend Father Gart Minot, who invoked the presence of the, of the Lord and started the proceedings on the right foot. Thank you very much, sir. Deputy Principal 
Ishen Kumbo Kawa and Eric Hosing, who committed to the growth and development of others through knowledge, but not only knowledge, but specialized knowledge. We thank you both for continuing to embrace this unique partnership between Guardian Life and UWI, which has spawned 10 years. And I want to say to uh, Dr. Kawa, the word that you are worried about, the expletive, it's mild, very mild. Campus Registrar, Dr. Camille Bell Hutchinson, thank you very much for bringing greetings on behalf of uh, Professor Nigel Harris. And ladies and gentlemen, to our Dr. David Yearwood, I want you to give it up for him. <laughs> he caused me to understand why I didn't learn much in school. <laughs> Boy, you, you, you made me feel bad. And I want to tell you something. We would never, ever want Eric to get up when he's, he's having the meetings. No, we would not. But what an inspiring speech. What a thought-provoking one. I'm sure you are all, like me, leaving with a lot of copious notes because my paper was kind of filled at the back here. I was trying to travel at the speed that he was traveling. You know, but uh, you said here that um, repeat to remember, remember to repeat. I love that one, given the kind of memory I'm having here now, you know. <laughs> I, I, I kind of like that one. I like that one. Our oh, chair, uh, the short of me, Alicia Foster, uh, I want to thank you for eloquently and expertly moderating the evening, evening's proceedings. Job well done. Uh, Metz Peterson, Peter, Peter King, sorry, for introducing our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, and on the same note, our entertainers, I was kind of rocking and, you know, wondering if the next one was coming because I was getting the energy right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the success of the evening could not have been as is without the planning committee. And you know, most times we see beautiful events and wonder how it happened. It's really the persons behind the scene. And uh, we're talking about Dr. Mervyn Chisholm and his team. Thank you very, very much for our evening well spent. And of course, the photographer and the media you have a very serious job there because they said a thousand words is represented in one photograph. And we'll see some of that tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank Alhambra Hotel for providing Alhambra, Alhambra Hotel, <laughs> the caterers, Alhambra Hotel, who catered this afternoon or this evening. And they're going to be feeding us. Um, and uh, we want to thank Hip Top Tents for decorating the, this room here. Thank you very much. And we know, ladies and gentlemen, the best gift that you could give someone is your time, because you will never get it back. And I heard you making reference to the time. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to salute you. Thank you very much. You have been a good audience. You have been listening attentively and making copious notes. I want to thank you very much for having taken the time to come and enjoy this evening. And we know that you are only richer for being here. I want to thank you very much.